appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to do some introductions. Maybe everybody could just type in the chat box um, what school you're from and, you know, where you're from. And then we'll listen to four student voices who uh, have created these wonderful ePortfolios and they'll describe them and how they got started. Then we'll have some Mahara updates from Christina and I will go over some items for the ABLE presentation that's coming up and then we can talk about planning a next meeting. So my name is Meg, I'm from Pace University. All right, thanks so much. So um, once Keith gets back in, I think he's gonna um, play some of the recordings that we have so we can hear the students. Okay, so it looks like I can change the slides. So I will actually, yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'll actually talk about Adina's ePortfolio. So Adina McRae is a first year communication arts and journalism major. She was first introduced to ePortfolio in her Communicating with Social Media course at Pace University. Throughout her pages, Adina incorporates her academic and professional experiences as well as elements of her personality. She was the March ePortfolio of the Month winner, so we featured her on our blog, Facebook, and Twitter. This student has shared her ePortfolio with friends, family, her advisor, and potential employers. She has added a link to her ePortfolio on her resume and on business cards. She's been told that it's an exemplary showcase of my skills as a student, as well as how quickly she's adapted to using ePortfolio. So here's a page that shows how involved Adina is in the PACE community. She is an active member of the Black Student Union and also Inroads, which is an organization designed to place youth in internships. She displays pictures from her high school graduation and has displayed a tag Zito, which includes her values. Adina's favorite part of ePortfolio is embedding videos. She's worked on many video projects and she's embedded them on her showcase pages for viewers to easily watch. It's user friendly, she says. Viewers can watch any of my videos without le leaving the page. It also makes the page pop and look unique. It was fun to put them all together and it was cool to have them all in one place. So that was Adina's ePortfolio, and the recordings are actually in the meeting invite, so if you'd like to watch them later on, you can hear the actual student voices. Now, this is Anna Bolivar. She's a graduate student in the Media and Communication Arts program here at Pace. She put her portfolio together in her Industry, Theory, and Practice course last semester and was named ePortfolio of the Month for April. Since Anna's background is in engineering, she enjoyed creating pages that show different sides of her. She's included photos of family and her native country of Colombia, which is important to who she is and the traditions that she still carries with her to this day. She's worked at Con Edison for seven years and has a page dedicated to her professional life there. Her bachelor's degree is in mechanical engineering, so this page reflects her technical knowledge and gives way to why she chose to study media and communications. 
By doing her ePortfolio for class, Anna learned more about herself. She was able to see that she was not just a technical person and was able to appreciate the fact that she does a lot of writing and public speaking. Anna likes the PDF feature because it looks neat and shows a preview of the document. ePortfolio helps her explore all of the things that she's done in the past that she didn't think would fit into her, her major, but they actually do. She plans to continuously update her portfolio moving forward, and she expects it to be a nice addition to her resume. Thanks. So we actually have our eTerns um, find, you know, scout out these ePortfolios and then contact the student with some interview questions, and then we post them on our blog and feature them on social media. So they really like that. But it's a good um, a good way of you know motivating students to to update their portfolios. Thanks, Christina. So now I'm going to pass it over. Um, I think Allie is next. Hi, are you guys able to hear me? I'm just I'm not sure if my mic is working. I can hear Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd just give a little bit of an introduction because um, I don't I haven't been very uh, present here in the mug so far. Um, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background on what's going on here at Carleton, and then we'll go ahead and show the uh, student showcase that uh, is from Carleton. So. Um, I work at Carleton University um, in the Teaching and Learning Center here, and um, we actually just wrapped up our first year ever piloting Mahara, so this is very exciting. Um, for this pilot, we've invited instructors to test out Mahara in their courses, so all of the uh, e-portfolios we've been looking at have been course-based. Um, and so the portfolio that you're going to see today is um, from a student who created it with a employability focus. Um, so I think you'll be able to see in Sandra's presentation how her instructor thoughtfully designed the ePortfolio assignment to support student learning, but also by creating a final product that will be uh, ready to use on a job hunt. And before we play Sandra's presentation, I should mention that we call our instance of Mahara CU Portfolio. Um, so Keith, I think you're in charge of pressing play, so could you do that please? Thank you. I'm Sandra Eckersley, a Master of Social Work student at Carleton University. I developed this e-portfolio for an assignment in a direct intervention class to link theory to practice. The development of this e-portfolio forced me to consider how to demonstrate how I apply my theories into my practice for prospective employers. My professor asked that students incorporate some of our academic assignments into our portfolio. So I took these assignments and really heavily modified them so that they would appeal to professional audiences. I, need, I needed to turn my mind towards the marketability of these applications in order to present them for this project. I really focused on taking theory and breaking it down out of academic language and into a more accessible form. I think that this exercise prepares me well for interviewing with prospective employers even if they never view this portfolio. So my portfolio is really intentionally simple and accessible. The simplicity provides me with the flexibility of easily adapting or modifying the portfolio for different employers. For example, I hope to add another page to this portfolio uh, once I've further developed some of the skills that I'm working on through my current practicum. The accessibility recognizes that prospective employers may not share the same professional language as uh, they may come from different disciplines. My portfolio my, highlights a meta theory, which is feminism, that structures my practice, and a theory as well that's more marketable for employers, which is the solution-focused approach. I gave special attention to showing how each of these theories plays out in my practice. The various media content in my portfolio helps to deliver this content in a, an accessible way. Instead of relying a lot on narrative, I wove in content from other sources, evocative images, a word cloud, a sociology news feed, and video content. 
I have several favorite features in this ePortfolio, and one of them is the word cloud that you can see here. And I've developed this to, to create a quick and catching image that gives a glimpse into my approach. I particularly liked the use of embedded TED Talks to give accessible and engaging pictures of my chosen theory and practice. So I introduce each, each video here with a short narrative that explains how it demonstrates the application of the theory. Each video gives a current relevant picture of how feminism can be applied to real life. So while one clip gives a critique of video game culture from a gendered analysis, the other is a departure from what many might expect from a feminist analysis and shows the ways in which a feminist lens can illuminate multiple, multiple forms of oppression and inequity. So both videos are really inspiring, they're easy to, easy to understand, and they're powerful. For me, I enjoy taking these various forms of media content and uh, replacing some of my academic language with some of these media contents that uh, kept my portfolio varied and interesting. And that is it for this part of the presentation. Thanks so much, Allie. That was nice. Um, so Sandra isn't uh, wasn't able to make it to the uh, the meeting today, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any, or you can always email me afterwards if you have any other questions. Hi, Keith. Yes, this is a pilot year. So um, the academic year 2013, to, or sorry, 2014, 2015 was our first year using CU Portfolio um, as a pilot. Uh, so what uh, what are some of the things you did to um, promote uh, the course use that you did see this first year? So um, we reached out to faculty members who we thought would be interested in using uh, ePortfolios in their courses. So essentially kind of targeting people who we thought would be early adopters. Um, and then we offered introduction to CU Portfolio workshops to instructors. Um, so really we just, and, and, and advertised it across um, also using uh, a blog um, and, and um, in our newsletter. So just kind of getting the, um, the word out to faculty members, and then we welcome them to come in with whatever ideas and inspirations they had, um, and we would kind of consult with them and um, work out something that would work for their course. Um, Sam, the support that was given to students, um, I had created a CU Portfolio support website um, that had guided tutorials, so I had recorded short videos and also screen grabs. Um, it would have been nice if we had only had to rely on the uh, Mahara user guide, but we had changed the um, look and feel a little bit to see a portfolio, so I wanted to make sure that it was as um, easy as possible for them to follow instructions. Um, and then also, I went into each class that used CU Portfolio at the beginning of the year to give an introduction, um, and it was a hands-on workshop, so that was where students um, would follow along with me, and if they had to copy a template, they would do that with me in that session. Um, I found that that really set them up for success, that they already had that portfolio ready for them within that first um, workshop. Uh, and then I also um, invited instructors to um, consider having me back if they thought their students needed a little bit more technical support, especially because this was the instructor's first year as well. So if they were having technical issues, it was nice to have me as a backup in that way as well. No problem. It's a little bit of a balance, I think. I mean, how much do we provide templates to the students to make it easy for them to get in versus how much do we leave them a clean slate in order to promote their creativity? But uh, I think we're, we probably need to focus a little bit more on, on providing some templates to our students here. Yeah, for us it was um, 
very much up to the instructor if they wanted to do it. So um, some instructors felt more comfortable going in, especially with their first time with the te technology, having a bit more of a scaffolded approach, whereas other instructors were really excited to kind of let the students go at it, get creative with it, and see what came from that. Hello, I'm Roger Emery at Southampton Solent University, and I'm here today to. Hello, I'm Roger Emery at Southampton Solent University, and I'm here today to uh, talk to Olivia. So, Olivia, can you tell me about yourself, please? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Olivia Farrell. Um, so, I'm 21, and I studied public relations and communication here at Southampton Solent University. And uh, can you tell me what was your reason for using Mahara ePortfolio? Yeah, so we had to use it for university assignment. Um, so we had a unit called employability and work placement skills. So we had to, you know, create our online brand and create Mahara to showcase our personalities and just the future employers, really. Can you take me through some of the pages that you've created? Hello, I'm Roger Emery at Southampton Solent University, and I'm here today to uh, talk to Olivia. So, Olivia, can you tell me about yourself, please? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Olivia Farrell. Um, so, I'm 21, and I studied public relations and communication here at Southampton Solent University. And uh, can you tell me what was your reason for using Mahara ePortfolio? Yeah, so we had to use it for university assignment. Um, so we had a unit called employability and work placement skills. So we had to, you know, create our online brand and create Mahara to showcase our personalities and just the future employers, really. Can you take me through some of the pages that you've created? Yeah. So one of my um, pages was called My Desired Industry. Um, this was where I just explained why I wanted to work for um, the sector I want to go into. So that's entertainment PR. Um, so this is where I just really express my passion for it, um, so that when future employers look at my Mahara, they can see that straight away. Um, another one was called Preparing for My Interview. Uh, that was just about um, an interview from one of my work placements I got in this summer, which was for House PR. And that included you know, some uh, outfits that I could have worn to my interview, as well as some mock-up things I created. So I made a press release for them. Um, and also one of their recent case studies was regarding Empire Cinemas, and they made like a step-by-step -step guide to creating um, and having a really great cinema experience. So I basically recreated that and you know made it my own and followed followed the theme of my Mahara, uh, which is quite sketchy and like doodly, um, and then recreated it for them. You um you mentioned the uh, the design there, the doodles and the beautiful fonts. How did you create this design? So all of my content is actually images. So all the font was downloaded, um, and it was really for me. It was all about expressing myself and my personality. So the images were made myself, um, and it was just all about basically making what I feel is, is a bit like a sketchbook. Um, so I wanted to make sure it looked like what I thought it would look like in hard copy, just online. Um, and I feel like it really expresses you know, my kind of personality. Um, and so what did you like best about using Mahara at all? I think it was the best thing about using Mahara is that it allows you to kind of be free with your work because obviously at university we do a lot of academic pieces 
And it's just about really expressing yourself rather than, you know, having a specific format or layout to a piece of work and having an essay and having to use, you know, referencing. It was just all about being free and having, you know, being able to showcase your, you know, your creativity and just being yourself on it and not having to follow anything. What challenges did you have using Mahara? I think Mahara as a whole was a challenge because we've never done anything like this before. Um, the whole layout of it, you know, it is tough to, you know, come to terms with. But once you overcome that, you can really show off, you know, your personality and you can show off what it is that you want to do and your passion for your sector, which I think I showcase in mine. And what have you learned from using Mahara? I've learned loads actually from Mahara. Um, first I learned was actually patience because it does take a long time to actually get through it and, you know, piece it how you want it to. But I've also learned a lot of technical skills and writing skills. So writing for work that isn't necessarily, you know, persuasive communication and that kind of thing. It's just, it's more about writing for your future employer and, you know, make sure you and explaining why you want to work, you know, where you want to work. So I think, yeah, I think that I've learned quite a lot from this. And uh, you uh, mentioned your placement. Do you think uh, your work on Mahara helped you get the placement? Yeah, one hundred percent. It you know it allowed me to do things I've never done before. So, like I said earlier, I created a mock-up press release for an actual company and a client who is you know their actual client. So that enabled me to showcase things that I've never done before. So, like yes, I've written press releases, but for actual companies and actually sent them out and distributed them myself. I've never done that before. Um, and also allowed me to, you know, when I was at placement, I showed them a lot of it and they were asking questions like, how did you make it? You know, what was it for? What was the theme of it? And it really allowed me to, you know, just have something else. So instead of having my CV, I said, you know, here's a link, check out what I've already done. Um, and so they can get a feel for how I write and just how creative I am so they can understand me a bit more as well. Fantastic. And uh, what are your future plans now? So, um, like I said, I want to work in entertainment PR. So, um, I'm finishing university um, in May. So, after that, I'm going to be applying for loads of jobs. And using Mahara, I've also showcased um, my CV as well as covering letter. And also, I think maybe do some more internships just so I can get, you know, find my feet a little bit more in PR. And then hopefully get a job working for a music company. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Olivia. That's okay. Hello, I'm Roger Emery at Southampton Solent University and I'm here today to uh, talk to Olivia. So Olivia, can you tell me about yourself please? Yeah, hi. Uh, Roger, I was kind of struck by Olivia's comment about um, you know getting started with Mahara was a hurdle she had to get over, but then once she got over it, um, you know she found the the creativity uh, you know a nice um, a nice option. I'm I'm just wondering if if you know you had some conversation or worked with her while she was working on the portfolios to to know. What uh, helped her get over that uh, that initial roadblock? Um, but uh, I think Sam possibly um, can speak more because uh, Sam used to work at Solent, so I don't know if Sam can answer that question. But when I was talking to her, she is a very determined individual, so I think she would have got over um, she, she would have got over any issues uh, with the system, and she is now being employed by the uh, module leader. Um, to be a peer mentor, so she's now a third year student, peer mentoring second year students, and her um, force of uh, character, I think, is uh, helping them over the obstacles. Um, so, and I think part of her her issue is because she's very creative and likes, uh, as you can see, drawing and pictures. Um, she found Mahara quite, you know, texty and and square boxes. So she came up with a novel way around that. And that was just make almost everything pictures. There was a few extra bits in there, like a CV and a CPD block. But um, I'll just hand over to Sam if she wants to say any more. I was uh, working with her at the time. Can you all hear me okay? Check in. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. 
Um, so Olivia was quite lucky. She was one of the first cohort to actually have student mentors in the classroom. So she was um, very lucky to have a group of students that have already gone through the whole process of creating a portfolio, going out on work placement, and then being able to reflect on, oh, I wish I'd done that with my portfolio. So she was um, inspired by some of the previous year's students who decided to make their own graphics. But instead of just adding one or two pictures, she went the whole hog and completely redesigned Mahara. So um, as with all the students on the PR course, they have uh, five timetabled Mahara sessions, which last for two hours. Um, they're all in a computer room. They all problem solve together. And they all start off very scared and nervous at the beginning. But by the second or third session, they are showing each other how much they've progressed. And they, they properly inspire each other. So. Yes, it is a technical hump at the beginning, but we all found that when we first touched it, and it does get better the more you use it and the more you understand it. I think uh, just to add to that, um, Mahara has got um, version by version much more user friendly. So I think where we possibly started was with quite an early version of Mahara. Um, I can't remember 1.2, maybe earlier. Um, so as far as usability goes, it's moved a very long way in that time. Um, so some of the things Olivia, so she's now a third year student, she would have experienced three years ago. That's a fair few versions of um, Mahara ago as well. So she, she sort of probably wouldn't experience so many problems now as she did at the time, if that makes sense. And yes, we have skins activated, and uh, Christina, who works in the office, was writing some help about that today, so we're looking at promoting that um, for the next academic year. Great, thanks. It was really nice to see the student showcases and hear from the students um, about their portfolios. So next, if we're done with the, oh, one more to show, that's great. This is Adina McCray, and I'd like to thank Academic Technologies for selecting my ePortfolio as the winner for March. So I actually got into ePortfolio through a class, and we were required to um, create an ePortfolio with a certain amount of pages. And so this is just one of my pages um, that has a lot of my activities on it. I'm involved with the Union here. In Rose is an, uh, another program that I'm involved in. And I pictures from my graduation in high school, and there are actually a lot of, a lot of other pictures. Um, and then there's an, a wordle about me that just has a few words that I you know, put in my life. This is um, another ePortfolio page that I'm really proud of that has a lot of projects that I've participated in while I was working um, in my job in high school. And then there are also some projects that I did on my own um, on this page. And it was really fun to put them all together because it's something that I love to do, and it's, it was really cool to have them all in one place uh, for people to see when they're looking at my portfolio. All right, great. So I think Christina is ready to give us some Mahara updates next. We have some new features to look forward to. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so while the um, presentation is uploading, just a quick uh, sound check to see if everyone can hear me. Okay, fantastic. So we should be there any second now. Uh, let me just um, see that I can just adopt the screen a bit better so that you don't... Yeah, okay, here we go. So 1504, um, a lot of you will probably still, still remember how we got to the, our new numbering system. Um, and just uh, a quick reminder because we, we were jumping from Mahara 1.10 to Mahara 1504 and that is not a, a totally huge jump in features and completely complete redesign of Mahara, but rather we switched to a new numbering system. Uh, so now, instead of just counting up numbers uh, for our versions, we switch to a date-based system so that um, you will see more clearly and more easily uh, what version of Mahara you actually use. And so in the case of 1504, that means that it's the year 2015 and the month um, of April when we release Mahara. So the next version will come in six months' time, which will be then 15.10 or 15.10 um, for 2015 and October. Um, and so there is a whole lot of new functionality in, in this new version of Mahara. So I'll only highlight um, some of them to give you a little taste of uh, what you can expect once you have it installed on a test server and then also once you're ready for upgrading your production server, um, what your students and faculty can see. Oops, sorry. So one, one of the uh, first things that has been asked for for a very long time is to make it easier uh, to copy a page or copy a collection. So what we've implemented is this copy button, which you can see on any page that you have the permission to copy. So it will appear on your own pages, but it will also appear on other people's pages um, that they have shared with you where copying is allowed. And so if you have a collection, then um, you still only have one copy button but you'll get a pop-up window which asks you whether you just want to uh, copy that particular page that you're currently on or whether you want to copy the entire collection. So that'll hopefully make it much, much easier for people to immediately see when they can copy um, something into their portfolio instead of you having to give them five steps and say, go to portfolio, click copy a page button, find the page, make sure that you copy the page or the collection that you want and then go through the rest of those steps. So what you can do instead is you give them the URL to the page or collection that you want them to copy and then they simply click the copy button. So I think it reduces things um, by a good number of steps. And um, in Adelaide, when, when I presented on the new features of Mahara just a couple of weeks ago, um, that was one of the features that the audience loved most and um, was looking forward most. So we are really excited to have that in Mahara now. Because yes, Ali, it is a very easy to now copy templates and will make your life as support people also easier because you, you simply don't have to explain so much or create um, a lot of documentation around something that should be very simple. Um, uh, we also have, um, or we also make it easier to see um, feedback that has been placed on individual um, artifacts or evidence that you put into a page. And that feature is thanks to New York Institute of Technology. Um, because what you'll see here is when you are on a regular block where you allow the, uh, where you allow comments and feedback, you'll first see an add comment link at the bottom right. Um, at the yeah at the bottom of the block, and um, you also see comments, which is also a link, and the co number of comments that have already been left. And when you click that link, um, the actual comments will fold out directly on the page, so that you don't have to go to another page to view the comments, but you can view them directly here. 
again, making it easier to interact with what has already been said for, the, um, for that evidence and um, just see things directly on the page. Um, when you click the Add Comment button, you are currently still taken to the actual uh, details page where you can then leave your feedback. So we haven't made any changes there yet. Um, because it, it got a little bit complicated with, um, with more and more pop-ups on the page. So we left, we left that for the time being um, and just want to try the functionality as it is right now to show the comments directly on feedback. And if, a, if you do not see one or both of those links, so the add comments or the comments link, then that means that um, the author of the portfolio has not allowed you to leave comments or has um, comments entirely turned off. So it, it does work with the comments permission. And another one that has been long awaited is a, um, the possibility that you can now select internal images from Mahara more easily in text boxes, in notes, and in journals. And that is thanks to Mike Kelly at the University of Arts London. So what you see here is the new screen when you click on the little um, image icon in your text editor anywhere in Mahara. And you'll first at the top see an image URL. So you can continue to put in an, a URL from an external image that you found online that you just want to link to. Or alternatively, you can simply select an image um, that you either have already uploaded to Mahara, or if you haven't uploaded it yet, you can upload it directly from the screen here. And uh, the URL to that image, so the internal Mahara URL, will be placed into the image URL so that you don't have to um, do that yourself, do a lot of copying and pasting, and then the image not really being embedded properly or other people won't be able to see it. So all those issues um, should really be resolved right now. Um, again, making it easier to work with what is in your portfolio. And um, yes, at the bottom there, the slightly cut off, um, you can also select an image that you have already uploaded, like um, any, anywhere in Mahara when, when you want to embed an image um, into a regular blog. And we also have drag and drop on mobile. Um, so Roger, that is something for you to try out now that, uh, that you are watching here on a mobile device. Um, it looks much, much nicer now when you go into the edit screen that you can actually drag and drop blocks. So instead of having to click a tiny radio button and then an, another button for saying where you want to put a block, all you need to do, like on a desktop computer or on a laptop, um, just drag and drop the blocks into the page, and then they'll be available for you. And not a new feature, but um, just a quick um, question for you. If you are interested in mobile and using an, a native app for Mahara, please do consider um, contacting Scott Allen. He's a student uh, from Victoria University, Wellington, who is currently investigating the usability and new functionality for Mahara Droid, which is the an Android application for Mahara. And um, he wants to know how people are currently using it, what is missing in there, to get a better sense of what we should be offering for Mahara Droid in the future. Mahara Droid has recently been updated to include new functionality that has already existed for quite some time, but hasn't made it out of the beta stage. And it has also been updated to work with newer version of Android, so that you can actually install it on an Android for, um, for a mobile device. So if you are interested in mobile apps in general, it doesn't have to, you don't necessarily have to be an Android user. So if you say, well, I want a mobile app for um, iOS as well, and uh, you want to give your opinion, um, you yeah, want to let us know what you would like to see of an app um, of Mahara, then please contact Scott so he can um, send you his questionnaire or even have a um, online conversation about what what you think should be in a mobile app so that he has more research data to 
evaluate and then um, see what he can implement um, because he is currently doing his um, industry uh, project of um, in an engineering course with Acid Catalyst and so he um, has a lot of research to complete as part of that course which makes it really nice because he can go really into the depth of things um, but also the the purpose of the project is to come up with a prototype or depending on how much uh, how much functionality should be in there um, potentially even already a completely functional product and an update to it um, Keith quick question um, in regards to your your, uh, your your question is portfolio app and iOS comparable uh, to Mahara Droid or do they have different functionality um, the functionality is pretty complementary these days because portfolio app has just been updated and is now called experience app um, I have not seen it in action myself, um, but once I'm talk, uh, finished talking, I'll see that I find the page where they talked about the functionality that uh, Bright Cookie wanted to implement for Experience App, so that you can take a look there. And um, they did certainly upgrade the functionality in general um, to put more features in that were also in Mahara Droid, and then some others as well. Of course, being an iOS device means that um, it is not possible to upload as many different file types as you can do on Mahara Droid because you are pretty much limited to images and videos, whereas on Mahara Droid you can, you can share pretty much anything that you can share on your Android device. Um, but that is not a limitation kind of of the, uh, of the app itself, but really just iOS. Okay, so if you want to help get it, uh, making Mahara better on mobile, in particular in regards to a native app, please um, get in touch with Scott, or you are also welcome to get in touch with me, and I'll forward your contact details to him then. Okay, but now let's go on to some more new features of Mahara. Um, displaying of pages in a group, thanks to Switch, which is a... Um, an organization that supports um, Swiss universities and has a central Mahara instance in Switzerland that um, universities can access. Um, we have a number of new functionalities in, um, for the group homepage. Because in the past you could only see pages sorted alphabetically, now you can sort them according to when they have been updated last. And um, you can also decide whether you only want to display pages shared by members of the group or by anybody. And that's a really cool feature because if you have if you set up a group um, for one one cohort, you put everyone in, and then the students share their portfolio, and they don't put an end date to it. All these portfolios will still show in the next semester, and the next semester, and and so on. Um, but the students aren't actually in the um, in the group or aren't in the class anymore, and new students' portfolios don't really show up because they are just um, way at the bottom. So what we did instead was to make it so that um, when students leave the group or are removed from a group that the administrator of the group can also decide whether those portfolios should not be displayed on the group homepage. The portfolios are still accessible because you can always still go to the uh, Shared With Me page and in your portfolio in order to see them. However, they won't clutter the group homepage screen, which is usually for the members of the group. Um, and uh, then you can also um, do the exact same thing for collections and what you will also see is by uh, pages shared on the, um, with the group you'll also have the um, date when it was last updated uh, displayed so that you can see very easily um, whether you've already looked at it or not. And 
um, again, those were alphabetical. Another uh, feature coming out of Europe from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology by Tobias Teuch is that um, CSV import now also recognizes a semicolon instead of a comma as a separator um, without um, prompting you to change uh, your CSV file because apparently that is the default in some spreadsheeting software, making it easier again for people just also to, to upload a CSV file and work with it instead of having to fiddle with the separator, which may not really be easy to see. Oops, somebody is moving my slides, so I'll just try to move on. And uh, we have another um, seemingly small feature, but it is actually the um, start of a bigger feature um, for smart evidence. Um, let me just briefly give you a link to what smart evidence is, because Shane Nussler and I talk about that in a uh, in a presentation. Um, and here we've implemented one of the first things, namely annotations, because smart evidence is a way to um, make the um, make the building of portfolios that need to be standard compliant easier. And because it's a huge functionality, we started with uh, with one feature that can stand alone on its own and can already be implemented. And so this is the annotations feature. So the idea behind the annotation is that you can put an annotation onto a page and it is pretty much a reflection of what is what you can see on the page itself. And people can also leave uh, feedback on that annotation. But once sorry, feedback has been left, you are not able to make changes to your annotation anymore. Um, making it so that the feedback still goes to what you have said earlier. And it ties in nicely with smart evidence because in the future the idea is that um, you'll also have a number of other fields on the screen when you create an annotation so that you can then choose the competency for, um, standard that it belongs to um, automatically and that it then is all displayed also on a matrix of which you can see a screenshot in the presentation that uh, I just linked to in the chat. Um, that presentation uh, is also recorded and the recording is already available so that will hopefully be easier to kind of get an idea more of what smart evidence is. What you also see on, to, on the page here um, under by the way is that we switched a lot of our checkboxes to be those toggles or switch boxes um, making them more visually present and hopefully also easier for people to click on uh, mobile devices and um, also easier to see what needs to be done and where things are at instead of just having the check boxes. So if you have any feedback on those as, as well, please, please let us know how they work. Um, we decided to only show one value and not on and off both because that is oftentimes confusing. And all you need to do really is click anywhere on that uh, green field to toggle between the two states that are there and um, work with them. Okay, notification improvements. That was um, that's actually heaps uh, heaps of changes just on one screen. As you can see, we've had um, iCampus 21 with Jack Meyer, um, Tobias Toy from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and also our Catalyst Open Source Academy students working on that to implement a number of features. So the first one is that you can now also compose a message directly from your inbox. Um, you can also see. Um, any unread messages first. So anything that you have not yet read in your inbox that is um, bolded, you'll see before any of the other messages. So in this case, a message from 2012 shows up before the rest of them because I haven't looked at it yet. Um, and then we also have reply to buttons directly in the inbox when uh, when you open the message so that you don't that you are not led to a different screen first in order to be able to reply to them but you can choose whether you want to reply to the sender or to everybody who um, has received the message 
and the sender, making it um, easier and more like a regular email program. And yes, uh, Sam, Paula has a friend. Um, and uh, one thing that you don't really see so much on the front end, but that I wanted to briefly mention is our automated testing suite. Um, we use BHAT for that. And that is automated functional testing. Um, that means that we write test cases, and uh, they, are then, they are then run automatically and um, tell us whether the test case still works or whether it fails and whether we need to make a change. So that's really great for regression testing. So when we put new functionality into Mahara um, and then always need to go through a lot of different things to test whether um, it breaks anything. Because when a computer goes through it, it is, the computer can go through it multiple times without complaining, whereas, as, um, as you know, when you test something for the fifth time, you kind of do get tired and might miss something, and so the automated testing will help us. And um, I'm sure we will um, provide more, and there is already in, uh, quite a lot of information on um, automated testing and how to write a test and how to use the test suite on your own servers on the wiki, but we will provide some more information because that can also be a way for you to get involved because writing those tests is actually not that difficult. They all follow a very um, um, a very set scenario and you can use just natural language. You don't even have to worry about any coding terms or so. And so that makes it really interesting um, also for non-developers to get involved in. And um, another really big thing that we implemented with over 170,000 lines of code uh, was web services. Um, that is the first step into the direction of better integration um, for Mahara with other systems. Because um, while we did have web services already as a plugin in the past, we now have it um, directly within Mahara, making it a component of core Mahara, and therefore easier for people to work with it, to integrate um, with other systems. And um, currently, we, we have the entire web services package in there, and connectors and settings. But with time, we our plan is to make it easier for you to use those web services um, so that you don't have to go through so many steps um, in order to set them up. Um, but it's already a very good first step. And it's also a, the, a really important step into the direction of um, removing MNET and switching it to a more modern protocol. But we haven't had the time to implement that yet. And of course, there is much more to come. Um, and you can see all the new features in the user manual um, at manual.mahara.org. Right now, you still have, um, have to go to the actual version of 15.04, and um, because we, we haven't loaded it on the home page yet. However, if you go to the index, um, so this page here, and look at new in Mahara 1504, you see a number of, um, fe oh, you see all the features on the front end that, um, that are new or sometimes um, receive slight changes. I still have to document, um, I think, two or three and update the block screenshots to account for the fact that we made a change um, to the retractable function and how it is being displayed. But really, the majority of the functionality is not documented so that you can take a look there um, and look into the user manual to really see um, the new things that you have read about in the release notes, where you can find them, and how you can work with them. And of course, now that Mahara 15.04 is out of the door, we are on to Mahara 15.10, which is our October release. So um, no rest for the wicked there. And um, 
there is still time to propose new features if you want to see something new in 1510. Um, feature freeze is in July, so if you have um, developers working on something, please ensure that they put everything through before then so that we can take it into consideration for 1510. There will be huge changes in 1510, especially on the front end, because we are moving to, um, to using Bootstrap as our CSS framework, so for the style sheets and how we, we set up the pages. And um, that'll mean that, again, it'll look more modern. We'll have some already through using Bootstrap a number of changes in Mahara itself, which make it um, easier to use again. But of course, we are also looking into making um, many more changes to improve the usability, to add new functionality. And um, yeah, again, to bring, uh, to take Mahara one step further um, and um, give you a new version that you'll hopefully be excited about as well. OK, so that's it from me. Um, Bas, when SMUD, um, the SMUD evidence feature, that's a very good question, um, because it depends quite a bit on funding. It is a huge feature. And if you're interested in helping develop it either by contributing functionality or by uh, sponsoring part of it, that would be very much appreciated. Um, we started the development work together with the University of Canberra. Um, I forgot to mention that on the slide. Um, and we will make more information about it available as well. The presentation that um, Shane and I did in Adelaide was just the start of it, but um, yes, if you have, if you want more information, I'll very happily um, connect you with Shane and then see that we get more things out to the community as well, so that you'll have a better understanding of what it, what smart evidence means and how we can go further about it. Thanks so much, Christina. Those are some exciting features. They look great. Um, in the interest yeah, I'm excited about it as well. So I hope that you'll, you'll all be able to install it very soon, at least on your testing servers and then over the summer on the, uh, for your students and faculty. Yes, of course. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the ABLE presentation. So the theme of the upcoming presentation is employability in Mahara. The meeting date that we set for planning is May 20th at 5 p.m. New York time. Um, so if anyone is in this meeting now uh, who hasn't been invited to that May 20th meeting or would like to get involved, um, present on this panel with us for ABLE, please let me know. Um, you can email me. I'll put my email in the chat. And uh, we'd love to include you. So if you uh, aren't currently planning on presenting with us, please feel free to email me if you want to get involved. And then we can talk about planning our next Mahara user group meeting. Um, if anybody has ideas about agenda items now or dates that they'd like to throw out there, please type them in the chat box. But if not, we'll be contacting you via email. Yes, so we have, um, we have a meeting date set for planning the ABLE presentation on May 20th. And then I guess we'll be planning um, another Mahara user group meeting after that. Uh, just, just a quick note for, for the other Mahara user group meeting after the ABLE um, planning presentation. So there, there is a face-to-face -face Mahara user group meeting planned for the 24th of July, that should be a uh, Friday, um, directly in New York. And um, so we just wanted to hear from people if here in the chat today if the 24th would be a possibility. Um, it might not be uh, streamed because we did have quite a few problems last time when we tried to stream a face-to-face -face meeting, so we'll still have to talk um, with Larry and George about that. So it might just be a face-to-face -face meeting where, where people can come together directly in New York. The idea is to hold it at um, uh, Teachers College, Columbia University. So that would be 
um, in Harlem. It's very easy to get to. And um, just a possibility for everyone who will be in the New York area to attend in person, or if somebody is coming from, uh, is planning on going to ABLE and has to fly through New York, then it's right um, the Friday before the ABLE conference. And um, we'll um, get some more communication out about topics and who wants to present or show something. But just to throw out the date, for you to have it and put it into your calendars. Thanks, Christina. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. We're just about out of time, but uh, I appreciate you coming to the meeting, and I think it was a great student showcase. Thanks again to Keith for putting this all together. All right, have a great rest of the day.